Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. This October, the Kentucky Theater will celebrate its centennial anniversary. Growing up here in Lexington, I remember distinctly going to watch The English Patient when it was released in 1996 with my friends. I loved that movie so much because of the storyline's connection to the Libyan desert, its romantic plot, and of course, Rafe Fiennes. Need I say more? Ask any Lexingtonian, and they will have a Kentucky theater story, a movie that they saw there, a film festival that they attended. For 100 years, the Kentucky has been offering a wide selection of independent films and box office hits alike. But watching those films in the Kentucky is a different atmospheric experience altogether. Here with us today is Fred Mills, also known as Mr. Kentucky. He's going to talk to us about his time as the manager of the Kentucky Theater. Fred has been working as the manager for 50 years. His dedication to the theater is evident in the way that this theater and the staff behind it have overcome adversity, not just during the COVID pandemic, but throughout its 100-year history. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Fred Mills. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So the Kentucky Theater will be celebrating 100 years. How exciting is that? I know you guys just had an event to to celebrate. How was the planning of that? Yeah, very exciting. Uh, in fact, this entire month, mm-hmm. you know, is a celebratory month. Oh, cool. And so, but our big event that we were calling the gala mm-hmm. was this past Saturday, nice. October the 8th. Mm-hmm. So that only happens once. <laughs> you only celebrate 100 years once. Yes. Well, we hope another century of, of service for the Kentucky Theater. That would be lovely. Lovely. So tell us a little bit about the Kentucky Theater and its beginnings Sure. The, uh, it was the Swito family, mm-hmm. that's S-W-I-T-O-W. Mike Swito, the father, had three sons, Harry, Fred, and Sam. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Switos were Russian Jew immigrants, and they were sort of exiled or chased out of Russia, if you will, for their beliefs. religions and beliefs. Harry Swito was the boy genius, if you will, of his time. He was 24 years old. And he lived next door to the theater, which was the Lafayette Hotel, which is now the government center. So he, it took one year for the theater to be built, which is pretty amazing, is amazing. just one year. Yes, yes. And uh, so he overseen the whole construction and building of the theater. His fingerprints is left on everything in the theater. Yeah. He was, a, uh, you know, an engineer, uh, I guess you'd say a civil uh, electrical engineer, and probably for that time, 1922, I bet there there probably was that maybe uh, three or four hundred engineers, electrical mm-hmm. engineers in the whole U.S. Probably, yeah. The theater opened in uh, October 1922, And uh, the Swido family operated the theater, I believe, for maybe around 10 years. Okay. They uh, leased the theater out to a company called Paramount Public. Okay. Is that a local? No, it was uh, evidently it was a national uh, company Mm -hmm. that had a number of theaters across the country. But the Swido family... Uh, had a small chain of theaters in southern Indiana and in Louisville, uh, had the Kentucky Theater in Louisville, and uh, a number of small towns in southern Indiana, Jeffersonville, um, can't remember the other, uh, I know there was a Grand Theater, mm-hmm. but uh, Shelbyville, I th- Shelbyville, I think, Indiana. But anyway, they operated about, I think, at their height, maybe they had about three dozen theaters. Wow. The Kentucky Theater here in Lexington mm-hmm. was their flagship theater. I okay. think they were probably the most proud of this theater than any of the theaters that they had. What type of shows did they have 
when they first well, opened, like, that, like uh, live shows? Well, really, they didn't at the Kentucky. They uh, The Kentucky was built as a motion picture house, okay. if you will. It was not a vaudeville house or a stage house. Yeah. In fact, it was, um, at the time, uh, it's been uh, said and and recorded and everything is one of the ten best theaters in the United States when it opened. Uh, Also it was one of 50 theaters, the first 50 theaters in the country to have sound. Okay. And so anyway the family leased the theater out to Paramount Public for a number of years and then came back and then after that there were other companies the main company was Shine, Shine Theater Corporation. And at one time, they had all the theaters leased in Lexington. The Opera House became a movie theater. There was a theater, in fact, uh, just across the street from where we are, the, the Phoenix Park, mm-hmm. directly across the street was a theater called the Ben Ally Theater. Mm-hmm. And it was named for uh, Lexington by the, the theater was built by the Hagens, mm-hmm. and they named the theater for their son, Ben L.I. Hagen. Mm-hmm. And at Keeneland now, there's a Ben L.I. handicap every year. Yeah. So, and a little bit further up the street on the north side of Main Street, same side of the street as the Ben L.I., mm-hmm. uh, if you recall where the lion sits on the street over there there's a concrete lion that's on yeah, across the yeah, street yeah, yeah. well that was the location of the strand theater mm-hmm. and then up the street was the kentucky theater yeah. opened in 22 as we've said next door the swido family built and opened the state theater in 1929 wow so lexington was a lively art community even for back a then. really yeah, small, for a small city. Uh, and I think they in lots and lots of history it's been mm-hmm. referred to as a southern town mm-hmm. small southern I would say college leanings towards mm-hmm. southern small southern college town mm-hmm. so you've got still got University of Kentucky to the south mm-hmm. and to the north you've got Transylvania University yeah. and so it's like I say the history that I've read the social and cultural life early on early turn of the century early 1900s was theaters seemed to be the social and cultural life of Lexingtonians all right so it's been it's been quite a long time and a big journey for the theater tell us a little bit about the different I guess, iterations that the theater has taken over sure. the span of, of the 100 years. It's gone through several different changes and yes. gone through a lot of, you know, political, social upheaval. Well, I guess that we could say that that it survived, you know, some world wars. Yep, just a couple. It, yes, a couple <laughs> of world wars. It survived a flood. There was a, a flood down on... Uh, in downtown, uh, three feet of water. I've seen pictures of there at uh, MLK and Main Street, three feet of water. Don't know how much water was back on what behind us was called Water Street. Yeah. There was an organ in the theater, the Wurlitzer organ, mm-hmm. and that organ was, of course, in the pit and, and suffered damage and was rendered unplayable. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, there was a fire next door to the theater in a restaurant in 1987. Wow. The restaurant was between the two theaters, between the Kentucky Theater and the State Theater. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a late night fire. In fact, uh, it was just about the same dates as when the theater actually opened. It was seems like it was the 3rd or the 4th of October. And, of course, the Kentucky actually opened. On the fourth, but this fire happened right that same time period, and um, it was um, both theaters suffered really, really extensive heavy smoke damage, Mm -hmm. very little physical damage. Mm -hmm. But the result was that the theater, uh, both theaters were closed. Well, the owners of the 
the, the theater, the Swite O family. It was extended members of the family by this time. Okay, so it went passed down and, from generation yeah, to, yeah. okay. And it was said that they were going to open back up. Well, it didn't happen. I don't know what the deal was, whether it was uh, insurance, whether that at that particular time things were changing in the movie industry. There were other theaters opening in Lexington in the malls. Yeah. Had already, I think, I, actually they'd already opened at Turflin Mall and mm-hmm. Fayette Mall. Now you don't see that many theaters and malls. They're standalone buildings. Yeah. They're multiplexes with 10, 15, 20, 25, even 30 theaters yeah. in some locations. But anyway, the, uh, it did not happen. It's kind of unusual that the uh, theaters had, the, the Swato family had a 100-year lease on the land. So really they owned the buildings, but they didn't own the, la- own the land. They had a 100-year lease from 1922 to now on the land. Well, First Security across the street at that time, the bank, which is Chase now, First Security was handling the leases for, and everything uh, for several different families. Mm-hmm. And going back and, you know, of course, getting attorneys involved and everything, they realized that there was uh, uh, some uh, documentation in there and that said, you must maintain your buildings that sat on our land. Yeah. Well, of course, they weren't being maintained. Mm-hmm. For lack of a better word, you know, you had old, uh, burned-out buildings. They mm-hmm. physically not, but you know what I mean, that yeah. they couldn't be, they weren't operable. Yeah. So anyway, fortunately, the mayor of Lexington at that time was Scotty Basler. Mm-hmm. And Scotty Basler realized the importance of the Kentucky Theater, I think, to downtown Lexington. Uh, Yes, and he realized that, uh, or said, that he had gotten more phone calls, uh, visits, letters from, well, the general public, not just from Lexingtonians, but from folks all over central Kentucky, how much that the theater meant to them, and uh, people organized, and there was petitions and meetings at City Hall. So he and his vice mayor, Pam Miller, and Councilwoman uh, Deborah Hensley Mm -hmm. were successful in convincing the council how important it was to um, buy the land and the buildings and renovate the buildings and to get the theater back open. Mm -hmm. Uh, The city at that time desperately needed more office space. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the Kentucky Theater building and the Swido building okay. that's the Kentucky Theater's housed in the Kentucky Theater building and the, mm-hmm. the State Theater was housed in the, or Cinema Theater was housed in the Swido building. Mm-hmm. So the city got two entire floors of offices wow. across the front. They still use they them. Still it's, they're still there. So that was another reason I think that helped spur the council along and thought this was really a good thing. It was a win-win-win for everybody. The yeah. city needing office space and the public was getting their Entertainment video, yeah. So anyway, the theater, uh, they, they did all of this. The theater opened in 1990, reopened in 1992 mm-hmm. and actually uh, continued to operate the folks that I worked with then, my my partners then, Annalise Corsoni and Howard Stovall. We managed the theater, was the management company for the city, uh, operating the theater from 1992 to October again. It's back to October. October is a good month. <laughs> October of uh, 2020. Yeah. And we were a victim of COVID. Lack of attendees. And also no uh, very uh, small number of film releases. Of Don't know if there had been more film releases. People weren't going to movies, mm-hmm. so it wouldn't have made too much difference, I don't think. Yeah. So the theater closed, and I think the city was waiting for, we were uh, 
the city let us out of our lease, which mm-hmm. that, there was provisions for that. And so um, after about a year or a year and a half, whatever it's been, when the city, city thought, well, things were beginning to open back up, mm-hmm. getting the everybody sort of getting their footing again, mm-hmm. they uh, said they were ready to put out an RFP for management company of the theater. Yeah. Can you go over what RFP stands for for our listeners? That is a request for purchase. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically that you submit a proposal mm-hmm. and to the city, and it, it's required. Yeah. So anyway, they were going to do this, and mm-hmm. Howard and Anna Lee decided that, you know, once you're out and you've been out, it's like you're completely starting over again. Yeah. Yeah. So they thought that they did not want to come back, mm-hmm. and uh, Howard operates another business in Lexington. And... Um, so anyway, thankfully, the new group, uh, Friends of the Kentucky Theater, which had existed from back in 2012, um, to back up a little bit in 2012, uh, suddenly theaters start hearing that there's not going to be any more film, mm-hmm. that everything has to be converted from film to digital. Yeah. Well. That was going to, and, and, and Anna Lee and Howard and myself were operating the theater then, and there was no way that we could convert the expense to do yeah. that, you know. So anyway, we visited the mayor's office. Mm-hmm. The mayor's office, Jim Gray was the mayor, yeah. and uh, uh, Jim realized the importance of it, that there wasn't going to be a theater uh, unless that, uh, you know, that this was going to be done not only did was there issues there with converting the digital but the seats after about from 92 to two that's about 20 years i guess they were beginning to be kind of rough to sit in i remember (laughs) isabel yates came in one day and she said fred we got to do something about these seats you know and that's you just exactly see, you, how she would put it, yes. too. Yes, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I said, well, in fact, I've got a ma- meeting with the mayor next week. Mm-hmm. And so she says, well, I'll be willing to help do anything I can. Well, actually what happened was that the mayor explained that, and of course we realized this, that there's a lot of competing interests for monies. And so potholes, et cetera, there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of things you can spend money on. So anyway, the mayor asked Tap or asked Isabel Yates if she would uh, form a committee or a group, if you will, to uh, raise money, mm-hmm. you know, outside monies, not government money, to, uh, to accomplish this. So... Isabel uh, asked Bill Fortune Mm -hmm. to be her co-chair, and uh, basically they got the job done. They uh, raised almost a million dollars. Well, if anybody could do it, Isabel Yates can. (laughs) She's a hard person to say no to. Yes. And so she was just at the theater. on. She just celebrated her 98th birthday, and she was at the theater Saturday night. Wow. So it was lots of fun. And uh, so... uh, I think she got her interest in the theater way back in maybe the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she does, she, she's into all kinds of different things. She loves to play bridge and she's very active. Well, she was writing a an article on the Kentucky Theater and she came to interview me. Mm-hmm. And then she sort of, after writing that article, she sort of fell in love with the theater. Yeah. And I saw her more and more at the theater after that. And then, of course, she, this monumental task of raising funds, she got that done. Anyway, uh, as I said before, that the theater closed in 2020, Mm -hmm. and then the city puts out an RFP. There wasn't lots of people knocking on the door Mm -hmm. to run the theater you were still in the midst of a pandemic. 
and nobody knew still lots of not very many movies uh, releases very slow mm -hmm. uh, people reluctant to come back to the theater you were dealing with all of that if you if you read things you know that were that was going on New York Times everything how things were it was definitely not the same at the movies a lot of streaming yeah. all this stuff going on but the friends of the Kentucky group, Isabel had stepped away after, and Bill, after they had raised the money. Lisa Meek, who works at KTTV, mm -hmm. and Hayward Wilkerson uh, assumed the uh, chairmanship of the Friends of the Kentucky group. Well, they decided that they were, I guess you would call them sort of a fundraising arm for okay. the city. Mm -hmm. Well, the group decided that maybe we should see if we could get the lease management company okay. lease for the theater. So they had been thinking about this on their own, mm -hmm. the two of them, for years, that wonder what at some point if the Kentucky Theater Management Company, who was Howard Stovall and Annalise Corsoni and myself, what if those folks did not they wanted to retire yeah. or they didn't want to run the theater. Well, it happened <laughs> and they didn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. So Lisa and Hayward put together, uh, I saw it, prepared a booklet mm -hmm. in their presentation. Uh, I wasn't there, but I saw the booklet and um, it was very well done. And I thought, hmm, this would be, somebody would have a hard time beating this proposal yeah. that they're that they offered up to the city. So anyway, I think there was one other party, I don't know who it was, that was involved. And uh, so uh, anyway, they got the lease and they had told me they were doing this and they asked me if I would be interested in coming back to the theater mm -hmm. and helping them get the theater opened. And of course, you know, that's the theater's been my life, yeah. you know. I always tell everybody I have the best job in town <laughs> and still feel that way. It's, anyway, I was happy they asked me to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, they are attempting to operate the theater as a nonprofit. Okay. But, uh, you know, you still have to have money. Of course. And you've got to pay your bills. <laughs> and so they have, uh, thus far, they've done very well in their fundraising and there's memberships that one can get. Uh, various levels of membership at the same time, uh, you know, that you get these memberships and there's perks for you, but basically you're helping support the theater. Yeah. Uh, the gala that we mentioned, it was uh, not only a, a party fun, but it was also a fundraising event for the theater. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are today yeah. that uh, we're working towards the next hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to go back to your involvement in the theater. When did you first start working for the Kentucky Theater? Let's go back to that. Well, I live downtown, close to Rupp Arena. Are you in Lexingtonian, I born am. and raised? Yes, all yes, right. yes. <laughs> and uh, lived in the same house pr practically all of my life. With, I went to EKU, but uh, one of my neighbors, was actually one of the managers downtown at the theaters. Okay. And he was at the Kentucky Theater the summer of 63, 64, and he asked if I wanted a summer job. Mm -hmm. I said, sure, 17. So I worked some hours during the summers. And then my senior year at Henry Clay, the old Henry Clay, which is on East, was on East Main Street, graduated from Henry Clay in 65, uh, went to Eastern Kentucky University in the fall of 65, came back to Lexington every weekend to work at the Kentucky Theater, rode the Greyhound bus to Richmond and from Richmond on Friday afternoons with my suitcase <laughs> and went directly to the theater. My mom washed my clothes over the, the, the weekend. 
worked as many hours as they'd permit me to or that was available Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Took my ki- my suitcase to, uh, to um, work with me on Sunday afternoon, went directly from the theater. The bus station was up on a building that's uh, that's part of Central Christian Church. That was where the Greyhound bus station was at the corner of uh, uh, East Short Street and Esplanade. Mm-hmm. So I would walk up the street with my suitcase and go back to Richmond, and then next Friday I was back at the Kentucky Theater. Mm-hmm. So uh, my major was a real broad social science area. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of history, sociology, geography, psychology. Don't even know whether they offer it anymore political science, did my student teaching, had a teaching degree, graduated in 1970 from EKU. Mm -hmm. History teachers were a dime a dozen then. Very difficult to find a uh, teaching job. Well, my parents were elder. My mother was 40 Mm -hmm. when I was born. So my parents really didn't want me to leave Lexington. And so I'd always really wanted to teach school ever since I was a little kid. I'd take all the chairs out of the house and they'd say, what are you doing? And I was lining up the chairs like they were desks in the classroom. So I said, well, you know, I really want to teach school, you know, but I was having a difficult time finding a teaching job. And then they offered me a management job at the theater. Well, there was another lady working at the theater that had worked there since she was in high school and she said, if you don't take the job, they're going to offer it to me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the job, and I really don't want the job. I've been here all my <laughs> life. But if you don't find a teaching job, then I'm going to give up the job and give it to you. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. And I guess in a sense, the rest is history. Yeah. I've been at the theater uh, my entire life. I mentioned the Strand Theater earlier. Mm -hmm. Strand Theater was owned by the Graves family in Lexington. And so there was, uh, during those, the 70s, there was some folks that had all the theaters, the downtown theaters leased. And so I was asked to come from the, leave the Kentucky Theater, which was all the same company, but I managed. I was the last person to manage the Strand Theater, so for about a year, a year and three months, I came down the street to the Strand and managed the Strand, and then it was it began to be in disrepair, and uh, lots of more theaters were being built, as I mentioned, and so the Gray's family decided that they were going to close the theater, and the theater mm-hmm. got raised in '74, and. Uh, So I walked back up the street to the Kentucky. The person that was at the Kentucky retired. So I just walked back up the street to the Kentucky and basically been there the the rest of my life. It was meant to be for you just to be in Kentucky. I think so. Take care of that building. (laughs) And it's, um, you know, you take a lot of things for granted, but when you look around that it's really something to be able to work work in a grand building like that, you know, your entire life. Mm -hmm. Also, that many of my friends uh, had much higher paying jobs and everything, but I don't think really liked those jobs that they had, but Mm -hmm. they were well-paying jobs and they had uh, house payments and car payments and children to send to college. They really couldn't leave those jobs, but my job at the Kentucky, I've never ever not wanted to go to work it's you know it's been uh, putting in lots of hours there yeah. uh, many more hours there than I've been at my home <laughs> but that's fine it's 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 worked for me uh, the best part of the job has been uh, seeing folks that come in the theater mm-hmm. um, interacting with those people mm-hmm. and um, they've become my family mm-hmm. uh, in a sense uh, seeing them entertained, uh, that's the part that I've enjoyed the most mm-hmm. from the job. Uh, some of my friends say, 
gosh, you know everybody in town. <laughs> you sure and I'll do. I'll say, well, you know, I know their first name or I know their last name or I know what kind of car they drive or I know where they work or, you know, something about them, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. but it's, well, I think uh, everybody that grew up in Lexington has some sort of connection to the Kentucky Theater. Like, they have a specific memory, some sort of milestone in their life that was spent in the Kentucky Theater or... Yes, and you know that uh, their grand... You know, sometimes that somebody will tell me who they are and I'll say, well, you know, I know, your, I know who your parents are <laughs> and I know your... Uh, gr- even know your grandparents... Mm-hmm. And when I was doing my student teaching, which was done at what is now Lexington Traditional School, yeah. well, all the kids there, it was primarily uh, African-American, mm-hmm. the school was. Uh, S.T. Roach, that was a retired basketball coach from Dunbar High School mm-hmm. on North Upper, he became the principal of uh, Lexington Junior, it was called then. And... All those kids that I had in class there would come to movies at the theater on weekends. Okay. And I would laugh and say, I cannot get away from these kids, <laughs> you know, because uh, I had them all week in class. They're just and right then, after you. <laughs> And then they would come down to the theater, you know. Uh, I still see a lot of those folks. Mm-hmm. And uh, surprisingly, I can remember a great deal of them. I remember their names. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's been well. It's 1970, so that's been a few years ago. And that is a blessing. Yeah, yes, yeah. it is. I'm sure you were faced with a lot of challenges too. As much you know, gratitude as you get from from working that job over the years. You know, as I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. A lot of libraries are facing threats of censorship around the country. I know that a lot of theaters face the same. Uh, over the decades as well. Do you remember anything to that effect um, yes, at the Kentucky Theater I do. It's, movies? Uh, there was uh, mention about, you know, a couple of different companies that the theater was leased out to over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, extended members of the Swido family, even though they owned the buildings, uh, it w- went on to another generation, mm-hmm. and they did not want to operate the theater themselves because of their age or whatever, but they leased the theater out. Well, there was a group in the theater at one time, and I guess it was started in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these folks, you know, they weren't Lexingtonians or Kentuckians, but it was certainly a money-making proposition for them. It was, uh, and I don't... And I don't mean anything to be disrespectful, but it was take the money and run. So you did whatever that you needed to do. Of course, all theaters have, you know, you can only show what movies that are available, you know. And if your competition are showing the major, and they were new theaters and everything at that time that were popping up at Turflin Mall and Fayette Mall and maybe, I can't remember the dates exactly, but even at one time there was a North Park and a South Park and everything. So these folks leased the theaters and they um, introduced X-rated movies to Lexington. Mm -hmm. Well, You know, the time was right for that in a sense because it was happening all over the country in New York and L.A. and Mm -hmm. Atlanta and every place. And so anyway, I had to make a decision that I could either walk away Mm -hmm. and not have a job, but... I knew that the theaters, from conversation with this company, that they were going to do what they were going to do. And, you know, just as we see today with what's going on with political scene, Mm -hmm. people get sued all the time, and and you think that uh, something is bound to happen to them, and they have attorneys Mm -hmm. that they can fight in court and draw out things forever and ever. Well, the same way with this one. I mentioned to these folks in New York and Boston, you know, hey, you know, we're going to get arrested. You know, of course, they were up there, and I was the one that was on the front line. 
well, don't worry about it. We've got a, we've got attorneys too. Mm-hmm. We'll take care of it. It'll work out. You're going to be okay. So um, I got arrested several different times and was acquitted mm-hmm. and went through um, one uh, episode there with the devil and Miss Jones that was the FBI was involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I say, the time had come and it was happening all over the country. Uh, it was a First Amendment thing for me as much as anything else. And of course, I told my parents and about it, and because I knew they would, it was going to be all over. It was going to happen, and it would be all over the TV. And I didn't want them to be embarrassed. And mm-hmm. I think, for the most part, that people realized that it was not me. I didn't select the movies. I didn't book the movies. Yes, I was the manager of the theater. Mm -hmm. I was the face of the theater. But they knew that it was something that was bigger than that. And, of course, people have always said that Lexington was such a conservative place. Well, I've always thought just the opposite, (laughs) that Lexington was not as conservative as everybody thought it was. Um, I've have a friend who operated a bar next door to the Kentucky Theater at one time. The bar's still there. But the person, I remember an article that he was quoted in with the Herald Leader that he said that he had lived in L.A. and uh, and in New York and a couple of foreign countries, Mm -hmm. and he said that Lexington was the most decadent city he'd ever lived in. (laughs) And, you know, it wasn't out, it, you know, there was all kinds of things going on in Lexington. Mm-hmm. It it may have not been, everybody may have not known about it, mm-hmm. but, you know, there was all kinds of things that happened here, just like other places, but we're, particularly we're talking about the movies. And uh, anyway, after that, but that was the big event, was the Devil Miss Jones event, mm-hmm. and it, it all worked itself out. The Swido family came back in and started to operate the theater themselves, mm-hmm. attempted to change the X-rated policy, but whatever other movies that we were playing, it just didn't seem to work. Mm-hmm. They went back to playing X-rated movies because it was helping support the Kentucky and keep the, the Kentucky open. Yeah. Uh, then one day, I think it was early, either in late 86 or early 87 it was before the of course it was before the fire got a call from the the folks at the Louisville office the Swido office and they said Fred this is the last x-rated movie that we're showing okay. and so that was the end of it it ended just <laughs> like that and we like became, a flip of the switch that's yes it. <laughs> yes and we're, we're not going to do that and we're going to change the uh, the format of that theater, we're even going to change the name of the theater. Okay. And they changed it from the cinema to Movies on Main. We became a discount house over there. One of the first discount houses or dollar houses, however you might want to say it, in Lexington. And uh, actually started, even people didn't even enter, enter the front door of that theater anymore. Yeah. They came through the Kentucky, mm-hmm. and we had a... Uh, the box office was a uh, box office was used for the movies on Maine in the Kentucky and a combined concession stand and so and then they went on over into that auditorium but we completely changed everything and then of course the fire happened as best I remember mm-hmm. happened maybe six months or eight months after that wow. and uh, but uh, one of the things I'm the proudest of is that uh, back in the late 70s, about 78, theater under the Swido leadership. They had a theater in Louisville out in St. Matthews. It was a neighborhood theater that they leased out to a fella by the name of Marty Sussman. Mm-hmm. And he started this repertory theater, if you will, or you could call it a calendar house, or you could call it a revival house. But we printed, and so they wanted to do, it was successful. And a year or so later, they wanted to start the same programming at the Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And 
for 25 years, we published a movie calendar that was on everybody's refrigerator, pantry door, mm -hmm. college room, dorm room, uh, and for every, every six weeks that we had a new calendar and we showed about six to eight to ten movies a week. Mm -hmm. And it was unbelievable. And I think that it brought uh, back, you know, of course we were doing Sound of Music and when I first started in 65 and everything, and so Dr. Zhivago played there, a lot of the bigger movies. My Fair Lady was at, across the street at the Strand. Um, Cleopatra, I think, was at the Strand. But, of course, all these other uh, mall theaters, and then it became something else, multiplexes and everything. But the Kentucky, I think, uh, reinvented itself, if yeah. you will, with that repertory house that went on till about 19, from 78 till about 1996. There were similar, uh, these theaters similar to this were in, you know, mostly larger cities mm -hmm. in Boston and Cincinnati and Louisville and everything. But the Kentucky outlasted most all of these other, mm -hmm. uh, Nashville and Louisville and Cincinnati. We lasted uh, you know, it began to be a problem with uh, film distribution. Prints were not kept in good shape, mm -hmm. and you were constantly shipping in and shipping out, and somebody had damaged the film, and you would print these calendars, and then you'd find out that you had a certain movie that was on the calendar. We did everything on those calendars, from classics to to first runs, to indie movies, to you know foreign movies, everything. But you would sometimes find out that there was something on there that was going to be a bomb, and it was coming in two weeks, and <laughs> you couldn't do anything about it. It was already printed, and it was going to happen. So anyway, things, you know, as everything, you know, things are going to change. So the booker called one day and said, you know, we think that you should... You all need to change. Well, what should we do? I said, well, I think you should be sort of uh, an art house cinema, meaning showing quality films, mm -hmm. do a combination of first run films, but mm -hmm. other films too. Yeah. So we did that. And this was probably in the nineties. Ni about nineteen. Excuse me, nineteen ninety six. Yeah. I was in high school. In, in the mid-90s, and I remember the Kentucky Theater was known to, that's the place to go if you want to watch an, an indie movie that wasn't available at the, all the big the big theaters, and that's where we hung out. So, yeah. And um, also the home of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Of course, yeah, of course. So talk to me a little bit <laughs> about what the different festivals, the different, you know, events that you guys are holding, both old and new. Well... The um, new folks, the friends of the Kentucky Theater, those folks intend to really focus on, I think, their mission or intent is more of a, an art house cinema, if you will, than we were before. I think we've always been, but I think that their intent is to have more of a focus on being an art house theater. They plan to uh, keep the best traditions of the Kentucky Theater, which mm -hmm. is, I think, uh, you know, every summer we do the summer classics every yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. And um, so we planned, we did it this past summer. There were 16 of them every Wednesday night for, from late May through the Wednesday of uh, Labor Day. Mm -hmm. So we plan to continue that. We want to do... It's in the works. We've been so busy with working towards the gala mm -hmm. that I have not been on in sitting in on a couple of the meetings with some committees. They would like to do a, uh, I don't think they've uh, determined the name of the festival yet, but it would be sort of a, a film, a, a, maybe a film festival that folks could enter from all over the country. Mm -hmm. Also, we did, it's been going on for some time, is uh, Schedule Media. Mm -hmm has done a film festival. It was the Rosa Goddard International Film Festival. And so uh, 
we plan to continue that and it was very well attended this year it was usually follows uh, the Wednesdays consecutively after the summer classics and I think that all of those seem to be more well attended than before that we before we close and and two that uh, we hope to bring music back to Main Street or back to the Kentucky Theater and as part of our celebration this month we've got Jeff Tweedy uh, who was with the, the band Wilco it's uh, Wednesday October the 19th and from what I understand there may not be but about 50 tickets left wow. and it looks like it's going to be a sellout so I'm hoping that this will uh, this will uh, continue the group that we're working with and it's something that they will want to do uh, will become their seated venue that when they're not able to do something they at their own location that uh, certain artists that would be bigger than what that they would be able to handle mm -hmm. maybe that we would bring them down to the Kentucky theater yeah. but first and foremost is the intent that it's certainly going to be uh, a movie cinema okay. you know that's yeah. that's the thing that we want to preserve yeah. we can go out and and do some different things but uh, certainly I know that not that they should or, or or they do but the public does not understand that you have all these constraints by film companies of course. in film companies when you you want a certain picture they will say, sure, you can play the picture. It's going to open on such and such a date. You're going to be playing it. Cinemark's going to be playing it. Lex Live's going to be playing it. Regal's going to be playing it. Uh, Brandon Crossing's going to be playing. There will probably be 70 shows a day in Lexington, and you have to play this film for four weeks. Wow. And you've got to decide whether that you think that you're are able to do this mm -hmm. once you're committed to it that means that that film has to play every single showing every day for four weeks yeah. so anyway it's just one of those things it's the way it is and that you're working with the That's major the name of the business. <laughs> major studios right minor studios small companies but mm -hmm. you know we're doing it and uh, um, we're learning the new group. Um, they're learning as we go, yeah. and so. Well, it looks like they're you know being very creative about the type of programming and services oh, that yes, they provide. Yes. Very yeah, and you kind of do post pandemic. I think a lot of organizations have learned to pivot is the name of the game now. Pivot. That's the <laughs> that's the word that's always yes. used. So right. it yes. looks like the new group is doing exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Over the years, how much movies do you actually watch, Fred? Do you have a favorite? Everybody's going to be surprised because all my friends think that I do nothing but sit in there and watch <laughs> movies. Well, that is the forest from the truth. I see very few movies. Uh huh. I do try to, each movie that plays, I try to walk in and watch a few minutes of it. But really... My day is taken up with other things, and I really don't have the time to go in and sit down. I mean, managing a theater <laughs> takes a lot of time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I do, uh, uh, you know, of course, I have those uh, uh, early memories mm -hmm. from coming downtown to all the theaters that were downtown and seeing Lady and the Tramp, mm -hmm. uh, all those big movies, uh, Dr. Zhivago, The Sound of Music, all of those things and, and seeing uh, I used to in those early days I spent more time on the sidewalk with crowds of people mm -hmm. than I did inside the theater yeah. but literally they were just lines and lines of people that you fill the theater up almost every show mm -hmm. so you're out there just greeting people yeah out there yeah. greeting people then yeah well, it's the same with librarians. A lot of us, the people think that we just sit around and read, but little do they know, haven't cracked a book in weeks. <laughs> but you, but you do know what, you know, who the author of the book is, exactly. and know a little bit, of exactly. generally something about the book. Mm -hmm. and, and the same way with our patrons, I think we have the best 
patrons in town that come to the Kentucky because a lot of them are uh, cinephiles and, mm -hmm. and movie buffs and uh, and they have uh, uh, favored actors and actresses but mm -hmm. it, uh, and, and directors and everything so uh, but I do try to keep up on a number of things but you know people constantly they'll uh, they'll give me a title at the I'm filling popcorn you know and they'll give me a title of a movie something that they've heard about well I may never hear of this movie again, you know, may, but they've read something in a magazine or heard, a, you know, a broadcast and somebody's mentioned a movie and, and who knows, it might never ever get made, yeah. you know, or it may have no, dis, doesn't have a distributor, but uh, at least it, it's fun to see, pe to know that how interested people are, mm -hmm. you know, and of course I think that... Uh, the only place that you should see a movie is in a movie theater. <laughs> and uh, I guess I'm kind of a little biased on that, but uh, I think that maybe watching a movie at home is kind of a lazy way to do it. Yeah. You know, you, of course I know <laughs> yeah. that you can pause it and you can go eat and you can go to the bathroom and, uh, you know, everything. But I just think that... Uh, you lose a lot when you don't, uh, and especially a grand place like the Kentucky, of being able to come into a building like that that was built and meant to see movies in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think you lose a lot. You're sitting there and somebody laughs, and then you sort of, then you realize what that you missed. Because mm -hmm. you, you maybe didn't laugh, but then finally it hits you that, well, that was funny, you know, yeah. what the person yeah. said, you know. Yeah. And then oftentimes, you know, that uh, when the movie's over with, people don't leave. They go out in the lobby and, chat. and they chat and they all rap back and forth, you know, about different things about the movie and everything. It's the whole experience, I think, is what you miss. The squeaking of the chairs, the, you know, standing at the concession stand and meeting new faces, meeting yes. new people, and and seeing, you know, your neighbors. and Yes, and it, yeah, it is, a, you know, it is, I'd forgotten about this until, because, you know, with, as you said, the pandemic had changed so many things, mm -hmm. but that's quite the social place. It is. And you see all your friends mm -hmm. that are, that you relate to, mm -hmm. you know, lots of other people, but still people that have the same interests that you have in, the, in movies and everything, and a lot of times that if we're all showing the same movie in Lexington, a number of theaters, well, uh, there's many, many people that that's the first theater that they come to. Yeah. And uh, so it's, there was, and another thing someone mentioned the other day, I think it was a Frenchman that was in, and he commented that how that Americans get up and down during movies. They may come out and get a, a refill in popcorn. Mm -hmm. Evidently, I don't know. I've never been there, but evidently, this is they. Do, this is not a European thing. They go in and they sit there and they watch the movie, and they don't uh, unless they're they have to go to the uh, the bathroom, whether it's a, a one bathroom movie or two <laughs> movies. But but you know what I'm saying yeah. that they that he thought and commented two or three weeks ago that he was surprised at the number of people that would get up and down. You know, I don't see it that much. I do know that I do see people come out and and, uh, and go to the restroom. Some occasionally people might get refills, but I didn't see it, don't see it that much. But evidently he noticed that it was something that wasn't done in his country. Okay. That's interesting. That is an interesting concept. <laughs> I was thinking the other day that one of the things that uh, that I'm the most proud of, that when, of course, when I went to the theater, I guess probably integration had actually occurred about a year mm -hmm. earlier or a year and a half earlier mm -hmm. in Kentucky that if you could not separate... African Americans could not go into a movie theater, mm -hmm. so the Kentucky never had a balcony. Okay. So they could never go into the Kentucky theater. The smaller theater there, the state theater, there was a balcony, 
uh, so African Americans could attend there. The Ben Ali, there was a balcony. The the Opera House, there was that second balcony that's still there, and uh, the Ben Ali Theater had a second balcony. Strand had a balcony, but one of the things that I'm most proud of is, uh, and I did honestly, this just occurred to me maybe three or four months ago that maybe that I was one of the first people there being in management that that hired more African Americans, mm -hmm. uh, young people to work to, in this the This was the first job that mm -hmm. they had, yeah. and. I don't know, you know, like I say, sometimes you just don't think about things. But mm -hmm. I remember a lot of these kids that this was their first job. And, of course, a number of them that uh, if they come into town, they'll come give me a call or they'll come back to see me. Mm -hmm. Or I'll see somebody in the, a grocery store and they'll, do you remember me? Mm -hmm. And and they will say, you know, last week I saw someone. And she said, do you remember me? I said, sure, your name is... Ever. And she said, you allowing me to have that job, giving me that job, that was my outlet. And she said, this was my getaway. And then I started thinking that a number of other folks that had worked there over the years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, really proud that that I didn't think about at the time. I didn't give it any thought that, that if someone came and that and applied for a job, that just didn't enter my mind at all. And but then thinking back, mm -hmm. hey, you know, yeah, hey, I did this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's one of the things I'm most proud of. That's good. That's good. Yeah, societal n norms have definitely changed, and um, you know, just as around the country, segregation I think sidelined a lot of African Americans from going to see movies and. Um, and such, but employing them, I guess, was a oh yeah, way and to I didn't and uh, sort of didn't even realize what I was doing at the time. It was just somebody that needed a job. Somebody that needed a job, and well, good, good. Well, we are fortunate that we have you here to talk to us on the podcast and, and give us the history of the Kentucky Theater and a little bit about yourself. We really appreciate your time with us today, Mr. Fred Mills. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at le X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.